All right, so this is our third lecture in Chapter 3 dealing with one-dimensional steady state conduction. We've covered a lot of ground, but now we move into extended surfaces. When you see this term, heat transfer from extended surfaces, maybe that doesn't resonate. What is exactly an extended surface? But if you look down here, fins, fin, fins, it's fins, fin surfaces. And so where do we see fins? We see them in a lot of places. Automobiles, easy place to see them. Out in the radiator of your automobile or in the condenser coil in the front of the radiator in your uh, air conditioning system, there's, it's all thin heat uh, surfaces in there. So you have water flow through the radiator. It's hot. You need to cool it, get it back to the engine a little cooler. Air flow on one side, so this is a heat exchanger. They call it a radiator. Uh, this is the air coming across. Where do we see the fins? Well, if we just look right in here and zoom in, this could be the passageways for the water. And this is the passageway for the air. And the air will flow over these. Um, let me see if I can accentuate it. Metal parts that are inserted to help promote the heat transfer, those are fins. It's, that's what it is. Now we're going to analyze it where we come in and we cut right here and maybe we grab this section right in here. And then, so right in here the water uh, keeps that uh, base temperature of the metal that the tube that the, the water is flowing through at a constant value and then protruding off, we're going to model it as uh, being evenly spaced, there'll be an array of fins. Because this was a cut mark right there, it's symmetry, the tips of those fins are acting as if they're insulated, thermally insulated, because the other side is the opposite. And so, so little protrusions. And so why do they have fins? To promote the heat transfer in this radiator. So we start off with a clicker question. The clicker question is, is, how does a fin promote the convective heat transfer? Does it change the H? Does it change the area? Or does it change the delta T? So yeah, uh, the results are uh, pretty overwhelming that it affects the area that the fluid flows over. It's as if if you didn't have this, this webbing in here, these fins, basically it, it would just be that, that base area right there that the air would feel or flow over. And by putting the metal there called the fins back and forth, uh, it increases that area. So it's like you want to promote Good heat transfer, have a high H. Okay. So, uh, yes. So, that was my velocity. I needed to have it high to have a high H. But once you have it as high as it can be for a reasonable H, you're kind of looking for another way to increase Q. You don't want to have a high temperature there. It'll burn up your engine. It'll, you, you're limited. So basically, finning is to promote it by increasing the area. All right, it, why is it harder to convect heat into air than it is to convect heat into water? So here's another clicker question for you. Let's take a look at the results here. And we're a little bit more scattered, aren't we? So. One of the key things is, is the fluid, uh, we talked about it early on, this is maybe my solid, this is my flowing fluid over the solid. Uh, to promote the heat transfer, I have to get it through basically a boundary layer. From fluid mechanics, we have a velocity profile that looks like that. Do you recall that? Where U is a function of Y, the distance Y going off from the surface into it. What is the speed of the fluid at the surface? Zero, no slip boundary condition from fluid mechanics. 
And so really the fluid is kind of stagnant right there. When I do a conductive flow here and I do a little conductive right there, it's, it has to kind of go conduction only until it kind of gets swept away with the fluid. So um, the, the Q double prime is equal to the, the minus, forget about the minus sign, the thermal conductivity of the fluid and then the temperature gradient at that, that uh, surface in the fluid. Um, likewise, Q double prime is the thermal conductivity of the solid and then the temperature gradient in the solid right at that surface. But the key idea is, is if I have a low thermal conductivity of the fluid, it's going to lead to a low overall H. And so the, the key is the thermal conductivity. The thermal conductivity of air. How much lower is the thermal conductivity of air compared to water? This is a factor of 20. It's, it is a huge difference. Air is a good insulator. Really is. If you keep it stagnant. Again, that was one of the themes early in the class. Keep air stagnant. It's a great insulator. Uh, water, it's an abundant fluid and it has a great thermal conductivity. It's good for heat transfer. We're, we're pretty good. That's, that's very helpful. Now what we're going to do is we're going to take a round surface or a round pin pin and we're going to attach it to a base. And later we'll get to the rectangle, but let's just consider the round fin. And uh, <clears throat> it's connected to the base where the temperature of the base is a constant. And everywhere over this cylinder, there is a flowing fluid with a T infinity and a convection coefficient. You mean kind of on the top of the cylinder near the base, as well as the top of the cylinder far away near the tip? Yes, same H, same T infinity. How about on the front of the cylinder or maybe the back of the cylinder? Yep, same H, same T infinity. It's over the entire surface that the fluid flows over of that pin fin that's attached to the base. You might want to think about having a coordinate system Maybe the coordinate system is x, and it starts x equal to 0, and it goes out to the tip, and that's at L. L would be the length, the length of my fin. And in the next dimension, it makes it more complicated, but we can plot, think about a temperature. And we're only going to have one temperature at each location. See, we're going to do one-dimensional heat conduction and then it convects off of the surface as it goes out. So maybe it's really high, the temperature of the base there, and maybe right down here is the temperature of the fluid. It'll never get lower than the temperature of the fluid. But uh, maybe it'll approach it, maybe it'll go like that, and down where the tip may be a little bit warmer than the temperature of the fluid, but not uh, significantly uh, as high as the base temperature. So we're really interested in solving for temperature as a function of x. We want to get a governing energy balance equation and get the differential equation for it. What you do is you come in and you grab a little control volume which is a disk. So here's my disk. I'm going to separate it out. Okay. What's happening to the disk? Well, I have heat flow from the hot end, which is close to the base, by conduction into that side of the disk. I also have heat flow by conduction out the other side of the disk, moving, continuing on down. That's the two conduction components. And then off of here, I have the convection. Off of what again? Off of where the fluid is in contact. So I took a saw and I cut it, and I cut it. So I cut through the solid. Where I cut through the solid is where the conduction is flowing, the conduction path. Now, I, where I didn't cut, that part which the fluid is in contact, that's where it's convected. So we have, our equation is, is that we have Q, okay, this distance is delta X. That's how we're going to get our differential equation. A little, we, a little control volume of thickness, delta x. That delta x, we evaluate the q at x coming in, and then the q at x plus delta x going out. 
Now look at from an energy balance, Q at X going in by conduction is equal to Q at X plus delta X going out by conduction plus what goes out by convection, isn't it? That's, that's a rate of transfer, watts and watts and watts. So if uh, 50 watts is coming in and 49 watts is still going out the other side by conduction, it has to be one watt going off into the fluid by convection. This is an energy balance statement. We then expand it. We use our law equations from chapter one. Fourier's law for the conduction. What was our conduction model for this flow at X? Minus K of the rod, not K of the fluid, just thermal conductivity of the rod. Maybe it's aluminum rod or copper rod or stainless steel rod. A dt dx at the location at the face X. So we spent some time emphasizing what K is, thermal conductivity. What is my area? What is my area? In Fourier's law, this is where I would typically pause and get a few people to participate. But in the interest of time, somebody raise their hand and tell me what is the equation, what is the area, what is it? It's a cross-sectional area. Every now and then I may put A sub C to emphasize cross-sectional area. Now, what I have to know is I have to know either the diameter or I need to know the radius of that rod. In terms of the radius, do you remember the equation for the cross-sectional area? Pi, pi r squared, pi radius squared. Correct, that's it, pi r squared. Or pi d squared over 4 if you like to work with diameters. Now, we come over to the right-hand side. We still have a minus. Don't forget the minus sign. With the same thermal conductivity. It's the same aluminum rod or copper rod or whatever material. The same cross-sectional area, area could change as we go out further. That's a complication later. Later we'll talk about that. But right now, the area is staying the same. The radius is staying the same. Okay, then we have dt dx at x plus delta x. So what's different? These are different. The temperature gradient's different, isn't it? It's, that's the only way. So it's, it's a less steep. How do you like that term for uh, as you go further out? Okay, and then how about for the convective? Let's get a model. Well, we'll use law of cooling. So it would be an H, and then I have an area, and then I have the temperature at that location minus T infinity of the fluid. Now, this area is not the same as this cross-sectional area. What is this area right here in words? It's the... Surface area, okay. What we like to do is we like to put it as a multiple of delta x. Is As delta x increases, doesn't that area, convective area, get bigger? Isn't it proportional to delta x? So the area is equal to, for the convection, is something times delta x. What is it? Okay, 2 pi r times delta x. Can you see that? What is another name for 2 pi r? Perimeter. So right away, the students will get confused, like, what is this area? What is that area? I got an area for conduction. I have an area for convection. And one is pi r squared. One is perimeter times delta x. Now, at this point, I'm going to rearrange. I put the k and the a. Over here, I put the dt dx with the x plus delta x minus dt dx at x equal to the h perimeter delta x t minus t infinity. These both are multiplied by the ka. Let me clean this equal sign up a little bit. Okay, did you follow the mathematics right there? What happened to the minus? Well, I switched it to the other side, and that becomes a plus in front of it. All right. Now, at this point, what I'm going to do is I'm going to divide this side of the equation and this side of the equation by delta x. So the delta x cancel. And then I think about it. Delta x was arbitrary. I'm looking to develop a differential equation. So... 
I'm going to take the limit as delta x goes to 0 of this ratio. So let me do this. Let me switch to another slide. This term right here, the limit as x goes to a of f of x minus f of a divided by x minus a. What is that? And I'm going to pause. I want you to write that equation down. And as I walk around the room, I'll see what you put down for that. What is that? And then once you have that answered, I want you to say this. I want you to calculate the limit as h goes to 0. Hey, x goes to a, now a, h goes to 0 of what? f of x plus h minus f of x divided by h. And then once you have that written down, I want you to write these three things down. I want you to write down what is, you know, on the left-hand side of each of these, the limit as delta x goes to 0 of delta y divided by delta x. Notice that we have a ratio, isn't there, in both of these? And then what's, what's on top of that? Isn't that the numerator? And then in the bottom, the denominator? In all of these cases, we're doing the limit as the denominator goes to what? Zero, goes to zero. All right, so I'm going to pause, walk around, please write these down, and then fill in what is on the left-hand side of the equal sign. So anyway, uh, there's a class. How many people took Cal 1? How many people took Cal 2? How many people took Cal 3? How many purchased four semester credit hours of Cal 1, four semester credit hours of Cal 2, and some four semester or three semester credit hours of Cal 3. That's a lot of money. Uh, we don't get very far in Cal 1 without being introduced to little old DFDX. And how is it defined? That's how it's defined. Maybe it's defined in your book like this. Maybe it's defined in your book like that. Maybe you used dy dx. Maybe you used y prime. Maybe you used f prime. There's a bunch of little notation, but the idea is simple. Now, when you first are introduced, hey, calculus one almost ended my career. First of all, wasn't a very good instructor. Couldn't explain anything. And the concepts really are difficult. Because you have learned over the years, if I take and I divide by zero, infinity. And a few people put infinity. See, you have learned. But in calculus, it's like this is going to zero. This is going to zero. This is going to zero. But what's happening with the numerator? It's going to zero, too. And they're kind of going to zero at a rate that's a constant. And that's the derivative. Does that make sense? So you can't just look exclusively at the denominator. If this was going, if the numerator was going to a constant and you divide by zero, let's say constant divide by zero, infinity. But but it's this is the definition of derivative. Somebody right there said it, right? Fundamental theorem. I think there's some different definitions of fundamental theorem of calculus, but it's the fundamental concept of calculus, the derivative, for sure. So now we jump back and we say, right here, this turns out to be the derivative of the derivative of the temperature. What? I know. Once you get the first derivative down, then you get the second derivative. Calculus is a mind-blowing class, right? It's a challenging class. But you have the second derivative, and that's what it is, second derivative. And then uh, what we're going to do is we're going to put the, the h, the p, the, the k, the a there, and then we have t minus t infinity. That is what we call an ODE, ordinary differential equation. You couple it with some boundary conditions, and you have a well-posed mathematical problem. What we like to do is we like to get rid of this t infinity because it's uh, non-homogeneous. We want to turn it to homogeneous. And so we introduce 
uh, a different variable. Let me sco scoot down or go to a new page. Let me go to a new page. We introduce a new variable theta, which is t minus t infinity, and then we get a homogeneous. We don't have that constant term in our differential equation. A lot easier to solve, believe me. So it's a second derivative of the temperature difference with respect to x equal to that grouping of parameters. What they do is they say, look, at that grouping of parameters is always a constant. And you know what? I'm going to need to take the square root of that constant, so let's call it m squared. And so m squared, you see that in your differential equations class or your calculus class, is the hp divided by ka. Why didn't they just call it c? I don't know. It's, they need to take the square root of it later. And it's all positive. It's never going to be negative. So it's just convenient to call it m squared. That's what that constant is. And then this is theta. That's my differential equation. Maybe uh, I have that the theta at x equal to 0 is equal to theta at the base. Maybe the temperature difference is 50 degrees C at the base, 20 degrees C at the base, 90 degrees C at the base. That would be a, a good example. The other boundary conditions that go with it are a number of them. You could have options. You could have theta at x equal to L is equal to theta L, a specified temperature at the other end. That's not that common. What's more common is d theta dx at L is equal to zero. What is that? Why is that more common? First of all, what does it mean? So if I put a d theta dx, or maybe I do it this way, dt, I put a minus k a cross section equal to zero. What does that tell me about its insulated tip? So it's insulated tip boundary condition. This is the most common. And it gives us the cleanest, most compact solution. So this is common. And you could also do a convection on the tip. And the book covers it in the interest of time. Let me just show you the solution to that case. But you have different cases. You could also have the, that uh, x goes to infinity. Or sorry, not x. L goes to infinity. I have an infinitely long fin attached. That Then you have a, a different mathematical boundary condition statement there. Uh, so this is, this is very, very common, like 99.99% of the time. And then this one is the matching that's most common that we want to become experts at. So the question is, is how do I solve that differential equation with these boundary conditions. Derivative like that of the theta is equal to m squared theta with theta at 0 is equal to theta base and d theta dx at L is equal to 0. So what's the strategy for solving it? Do you want to employ the method of separate and integrate, the method of judicious guessing, the method of egregious lymphotomy, the method of symphonic tyronomy, or the method of efficacious groveling. And here's my big hint. Uh, if you don't know and you're just guessing, don't guess the most obvious because that's incorrect. So we're we done? Right, we're done. So a lot of you selected the wrong answer. A is not the right answer. You can try till you're blue in the face, separate and integrate on that one. It will not work. Uh, basically, I remember in differential equations when we finally, you know, turn the page, new section. Now forget all this technique. Here's a new technique, and it's now just sort of guessing the coefficient, guessing the structure of the solution with some undetermined coefficients, and you work to get your coefficients. That's the strategy for this type of differential equation. So on this one, you would say, well, theta is equal to C1 sine of mx plus C2 cosine of mx. That really won't work because when you differentiate the sine and the cosine, and they start changing signs, you get a negative. It works beautifully if there's a negative in front of that m squared. Then that's the one to pick, judicious guessing. 
but if there's no negative in front of it, so the form that we have to go with is C1e to the mx plus C2e to the minus mx. Or its cousin, which you haven't seen in a long time, is C1 SINH MX plus C2 COSH MX. Hold it. This looks a lot like that with one little letter difference, H. What is SINH? Hyperbolic sign. The cinch. But this is the preferred solution when you have a finite length, thin, and that's it. Now, I need to say, how are we going to do this math? Well, first of all, we would have to go back and review. What exactly is my cinch function? Does this look familiar to those that remember a little bit about cinch and cosh? Yeah. How about the cosh? And so the little difference is the minus sign. How about the hyperbolic tangent? That's the cinch over cosh, and it boils down to this. We're going to see the hyperbolic tangent. You need to be able to evaluate that on your calculator. Also, we have to remember, well, how to take the derivative of the cinch. What does that give us back? The cosh, with or without a minus sign? Without. 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 How about the derivative of the cosh? Get back to cinch, with or without a minus sign? Without. without. And you can go back and prove it to yourself by the definitions. And then there's one little, like, I would call this almost a trigonometric, but it's a hyperbolic identity. And you would need to know this one to slug through the math. So in the interest of time, I'm going to say those that are interested need to go back and put all these pieces of the puzzle and then solve that differential equation with the two boundary conditions I just gave. Okay? Does that make sense? And then when you come in and solve it, uh, you're going to get the solution. So theta is equal to theta b times the cosh of the parameter m, l minus x. That's how you combine a bunch of terms into one packaged up term, divided by the cosh of ml. That's to get the temperature distribution. Once you get the temperature distribution, you really are interested with the flow of heat. You want to know what goes into the fin, because if it comes into the fin at the base, doesn't it go out eventually into the fluid? So from an energy balance, I want to get what goes into the fin, which is minus K A dt dx at the base, zero. That's going to tell me what gets. Well, I just solved for the temperature profile. And so now you can solve for the, the overall rate of heat transfer. And the way that we package this up, is we have Q into the fin is equal to some fin efficiency times Q as if the whole fin was at the base temperature. It's like Q max. So you couldn't put any more in into the fluid if the whole fin was at your base temperature. So what is this Q max? Leave that fin efficiency there. Wouldn't it be just the convection coefficient times the perimeter times the total length, the total length of the fin, times, see this is my convective area, times the base temperature minus T infinity. See, it's as if you assume everywhere along the whole length of the fin it was the base temperature, the highest temperature. That gives us the max. And so this... The math boils down, I mean, engineers work hard to boil stuff down to simple terms. Now, what is the equation for this efficiency? The equation for the efficiency is, is you have the hyperbolic tangent, again, packaging up these terms, of ML divided by ML. What exactly was M again? Well, M is a parameter. It's a fin parameter. Square root of the HP divided by KA. What was L? The length. This solution is everything is the insulated tip. Professor, you said that was the case that's most general. Sure it is. Because, okay, did you write all these down? Because we're just going to come and use them again now in a minute. 
Okay, we'll use the one for the temperature distribution, and we'll use the one for the efficiency, and then we'll use the one for the overall heat transfer. Either one, either one of these forms is good. Okay. Uh, there I worked out the little detail. Okay. A lot of times you'll see used in the textbook a corrected length. They'll say the length with a little correction. What they're doing is they're going to use the simple solution as if the tip was insulated, and they'll add a little extra to account for the convection off the tip, but still use the correlation for the insulated tip solution. And that makes sense. So let's say I have this diameter or radius right here. What they would say is the corrected length is the actual physical length plus some radius divided by 2, half the radius. I add a little bit. It's not perfect, but hey, we're engineers. It gets us really close. In this game, thinking that the convection coefficient h is uniform over the entire fin, probably not true. So this is okay. We're going to also study rectangular fins. I've tried to avoid them because it's just an added complexity. This is the thickness, so to speak, the height or the T, and this is the width of the rectangular fin. Let me ask you a little bit. Uh, let's say that it goes back and attaches to the base, and this is the base back here. Okay. What would be the cross-sectional area for conduction down the length of that rectangular fin in terms of T and W? What is AC? T times W. Professor asked me a harder question. That was too easy. Okay, fine. Give me P, the perimeter. 2T plus 2W. It's as if you go up a T, over a W, down a T, back a W. 2T plus 2W, correct. If you want the corrected length, it'll be the physical length plus a little bit. It's as if you cut this and flipped it to the top and bottom, and it would be the thickness divided by 2. So this is a formula for the corrected length for a round, and this is a formula for the corrected length on a rectangular fin. And so these are the equations we like to use. Okay, this is the simple case that gives us the compact solution. And so case B in this table out of the textbook is for the adiabatic tip. And if you want, use L sub C in these equations instead of L. You just add a little bit to the actual physical length, and then it accounts for what's happening at the tip. That's probably a lot easier than using case A, which is the analytic solution. Thankfully, somebody worked it out, you know, the analytic solution for the convective tip boundary condition. A little more accurate, but come on. Do you really want the complexity? No. We go for the simplicity. All right? Now, if you have a prescribed temperature, there's the analytic solution. If you have infinitely long, it becomes exponential. There's the analytic solution. But 99, no, not 99, 95%. 95% of the time, this is the solution used in this class. Uh, pay attention to the footer down here. Oh, a reminder what theta is, theta b, m squared, and this big M. I don't prefer it, but that's the term that they used in this table. Okay. What happens if you have a radial fin like this? Well, now the area is changing a lot as you move out in the R to strong. Forget about an easy solution. If there is, it's got some Bessel functions in there. Who wants to evaluate them? You would typically find it coded up in a computer program, a subroutine, or a plot like this, where they're giving you the fin efficiency as a function of some parameters. And it starts when it's short and stubby, 100%, and then goes down as you extend the longer and longer fin. So how do we use that fin efficiency? Well, you would say, what is my maximum as if the entire surface of the fin was at the base temperature? Multiply that by the fin efficiency. That gives me what actual rate of heat transfer off of that fin into the fluid. 
Don't make it more complicated than it is. It's really straightforward. So here is a summary of table. I like this table in the sense of, didn't we just work on this one? Sure. That's our rectangle. Thickness T, width W, length L. What is our equation for the fin efficiency? Hyperbolic tangent of M L sub C divided by M L sub C. It's a little hard to see, but they did put a little subscript C in there. Well, that was one problem. Let's solve a numeric work it out problem. Consider uh, alloyed aluminum where the thermal conductivity is given for the aluminum. Uh, the rectangular fin of length L of 10 millimeters. So L is equal to 0 0.010 meter. The thickness T is 1 millimeter. So I put it in meters right away. And they tell us that the width is much, much greater than the thickness. What does that mean about the perimeter? The perimeter was 2t plus 2w for a rectangle. This is a rectangular fin. So in this case, the perimeter is approximately 2w. Forget the t. The 2t gets neglected. All right. The uh, base temperature, temperature base is equal to 100 degrees C. And the fluid temperature is 25 degrees C and the convection coefficients 100 watts per meter squared Kelvin. The Use the corrected fin length approximation with the adiabatic tip solution. This is really guiding you along right, uh, to that. So what is going to be my corrected length? That will be the length plus the thickness divided by 2. The thickness was given. Doesn't that come in at 0 0.0105 meter corrected length? I think so. Make sure you do these in steps and don't make an error. Or try really hard to avoid an error. <laughs> okay. Now, you want to find the fin heat transfer rate. How are we going to find that? Well, first of all, they're wanting this Q prime of the fin, which is Q divided by the width, W. So it's the heat transfer rate per unit width. Well, what was my equation for Q? Well, the fin efficiency times H perimeter corrected length, then the temperature at the base minus the temperature infinity. All of this right here is just Q max. You just get, what is the maximum rate of heat transfer assuming that the entire surface of the fin was at the base temperature? Hopefully that's easy enough to realize. Then multiply that by the efficiency. Okay, well, guess what? The efficiency is part B. So in this case, you actually answer part B before you answer part A. So the efficiency uh, let me leave a little room there. What's the efficiency equation? The hyperbolic tangent of MLC divided by MLC. Okay. So let's just start doing some math here. What is M? Well, that's the square root of the H perimeter K area. We already worked out what the perimeter was right here. Maybe I should have put, what is my cross-sectional area for the conduction? <laughs> T times W, isn't it? Isn't it T times W for my rect... Go ahead and make that little sketch, your rectangular fin, and it's uh, T times W. Okay. So let's simplify this. H perimeter was 2W. K, the cross-sectional area is TW. Guess what cancels? The W. And at this point, uh, we can put in our numbers. So our H is 100 watts per meter squared Kelvin. Our 2 has no units. Our thermal conductivity is 180 watts per meter Kelvin. And our thickness... Uh, is 0 0.001 meter. And I'm going to take the square root of that. The numeric value with any units. 
one over meter. One over meter. Did that see units? One over meter? And then somebody's working on the numeric value for it. 33.3. So we have that the parameter M is equal to 33.3, one over meter. Now I pause. This is one of the reasons heat transfers hard. Because is M on both sides of this equation? Yeah, one side it means the parameter M, the thin parameter M, the coefficient M. The other side, M stands for meter. So you look at this equation and you say, big error. Somebody messed up big time. But it's not. You, this is just the difficulty. Every heat transfer book I look at, when they cover the fins like this, the fin parameter is given the symbol M. That's nice for consistency. But when they move from BTUs and foot and all that, where it would be M is like inverse foot or inverse inches, they moved to SI, and they didn't want to change the parameter M, and you have inverse meter for units. So you just have to be on top of it. Sorry, that's it. You calculate the M times L sub C. That should come in at a 0 0.35. What are the units on this parameter M times L sub C? Very good, dimensionless. Can I have a dimension? Yes, you can have a dimensionless answer. Yeah. Now we stick it into this equation right here. This is where I want to pause. I want to walk around. I want you to put your calculator. I want you to put the hyperbolic tangent of 0.35 and then divide by 0.35. When I get five or six right answers, I'll move on. Professor, is this a 0.961. The fin efficiency is 96.1%. And then when we come up here, you can now calculate uh, this. Now, notice um, if I expand this P right here, um, this is, I forgot to divide by the W. But what is the P that goes right in here? That's two W. So the W's cancel. So the equation for Q prime uh, F, the prime meaning per unit width, is uh, a fin efficiency we just calculated, the convection coefficient, 2, corrected length, the base temperature minus the fluid temperature. And this comes in at 151 watts per meter. The last part, what is that tip temperature? Well, I have to recall the equation for the tip, the temperature profile. And so the temperature profile gives me that the temperature at any location, but I want to evaluate it at x equal to L. Maybe I'll leave it as x for a minute. Temperature at any location, x, x is equal to temperature um, at the infinity plus temperature base minus temperature infinity. Then we have that cosh of the M times L minus X, all that divided by the cosh of ML. And I'm using L sub C, the subscript that I left off. So if, if you say now you put in X equal to L, what is L minus L at zero? What's the cosh of zero? Cosh of zero is one, so that whole numerator is good, is just one. So you, all you have to do is, uh, let me scroll down, put in T infinity. The fluid temperature was uh, 25 plus the base, 100 minus 25 times the cosh of zero, which is one, divided by the cosh of ML, which is 0.35. And then you get an answer. Then the temperature at the tip is 95.6 degrees C. Can a few people confirm that and give me a thumbs up? One, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. Perfect. Thank you very much. So that solves that problem. So uh, with that, I'm going to wrap it up. Thank you for your attention.
Uh, next time we're going to cover the last topic in this section, which is an array of fins. And then we'll try and do a little review on Tuesday for the exam on Thursday.